And we're live. Um, I'm joined by Random Scottish History to talk about shocker Scottish history. Well, mostly Scottish history, some modern stuff. Do you find that surprising? Not really. Okay, that's good. That's a good start. <laughs> so I've got um, a range of topics with you uh, to discuss. Yeah. Um, sort of like Scotland's place within the Union. Um, mm -hmm. I can bring up the questions on the main screen, actually. You've already got these in front of you. To be fair, um, um, you sent me them, but yeah, yeah, it's all stuff that I've gone over a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I have to actually minimise this. So yeah, just a load of a load of topics. Talk about how Scotland became part of uh, the union, um, mm. uh, the nature of how kind of representation has changed. Kind of, I guess, the history of it, and then coming towards like the modern era. I know the modern era is not really your thing. Um, it's in your name, but like, I think it's probably worth discussing. I mean. Yeah, when it comes to the, the Macron report and um, Scottish devolution, I mean, that's fine. But it's all part and parcel of the same thing, isn't it? I, I'm not sure why Macron would write a report on Scottish um, anything, but sure. <laughs> but yeah. The, the uh, Macron report was very important, uh, but it was hushed by Westminster because it showed Scotland to be too positive and too wealthy okay um well let, let's start with how did scotland join the british union then uh, well, there's always been contention between scotland and england we're aware of that um we were having wars with each other all the time especially from the end of the 13th century with your bruce and wallace and all that your wars of independence when the english eddie the first felt like Scotland was part of his dominion. So um, it had got to a point at the end of the 17th century when tensions were super high. Um, there'd been uh, an English captain, Captain Green, I think, was executed by Scots. He was an English captain and the English were mad about that. But he was executed on the belief that he had murdered uh, a Scottish sailing vessel and its fleet, you know. Um, so they were readying themselves for another war, right. but they felt like the Union would be the way to prevent that from happening because they'd already petitioned Queen Anne to to secure all the the forts at the border, your Newcastle and Pearl Isle and all that. Um, but there were a series of acts that were kind of revenge acts against each other. England would enact one, Scotland would do a reciprocal act in return. And this series ended with the English Alien Act, which meant that any Scots in England were to be deemed foreign. Uh, the, but Which is fine, but if they had any English family that died, they weren't able to inherit. Um, no goods from Scotland were to be imported into England. Uh, the same from England into Scotland with an especial focus on horses and armaments because they didn't want Scotland to be armed for whatever was coming. And the Alien Act, that, that happened in 1704, um, three years before the Union was ratified. And the English basically said, um, if you enter negotiations with us in order to join a union with us, then we'll scrap the Alien Act, and Scots went, scrap the Alien Act, and we'll enter negotiations. And so that's how that happened. Okay. Um, but people weren't happy about it. Scots wanted a federal union. So a federal union is what home rule would be. They wanted a Scottish parliament to remain. They wanted the English parliament to remain, and they wanted an imperial parliament in the north of England between the two that would deal with any affairs that were on behalf of both countries, but also international trade as well. Um, but the Scots did not get that form of union because the English didn't didn't want that form of union. They they wanted to be able to have as much control over Scotland so, as possible so out of the union. Why didn't Scotland just leave at that point then? Because uh, it wasn't... It wasn't like how we would have a referendum or a vote now, the general population that were up in arms against this really didn't have a say. It was okay. those in authority, it was your lords. 
and your dukes and people, landed folk, wealthy folk, that had a say in these things. And Charles Waddy has very kindly provided us with a list of everyone that was bribed by the English Parliament um, with the help of the English monarchy, which was the British monarchy at that time, but they, they were very much focused on behalf of the English. They, they were very indifferent to the Scots. Um, this, this sounds like very underhanded tactics. I would not associate with that kind of stuff with the British monarchy. You wouldn't? Really? Okay. The sarcasm um, really, really being <laughs> laid on thick there. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, yeah. do you think that's why Scotland, instead of being kind of colonised by conflict, um, was done by a treaty because it would be a really hard conflict for either side to win? Do you think that's... Yeah. Because obviously um, Ireland, you know, Britain went in there kind of he really heavy-handed and decided to, you know, take over by force. Do you think that's why Scotland was different? Because I think even the Romans had problems with Scotland, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, people say that the Romans never made it past Southern Scotland. The Romans made it over the extent of Britain. The The Romans made it very far into Scotland, but they very quickly decided it wasn't worth their while because we give them a lot of hassle in return for it, so they kind of backtracked a wee bit. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think both... The authorities on both sides at the time of the Union... They wanted the Union. They did. They they wanted an end to the constant wars and the constant threat of war. Um, they, they did want to find a solution to that. And the solution was the Union. Um, Scots tried very hard to get exactly um, what they were expecting to get from the Union. They, they wanted equality. Um, it was said that in entering the Union, England England was no more united to Scotland than Scotland was to England. We were united on equal footing, you know. Um, what Scotland was to get, England was to get, etc. You know, um, it never worked out that way. But it's because the the act, the way they were worded um, in the Treaty of Union, gave a lot of unfortunate leeway that the Scots hadn't foreseen. So a lot, a lot of the articles will say something along the lines of uh, this article cannot be changed unless for the benefit of the Scottish people. But once it was ratified and we're in Parliament, we've got 45 MPs to 500-odd English MPs. So the people that were ultimately deciding what was to the benefit of Scots was your, your English faction within Westminster. Mm. So they just started changing the the treaty technically and, and it, like usurping on various uh, parts of the treaty to get as much as they could from Scots to the point where a mere six years after the union was ratified, Seafield and Findlater, two of the lords that signed off on the the union, um, took it to the House of Lords for a debate on Scotland leaving the union. They had already had enough. They, they saw how the, the ground was laid. They saw what the future held for Scotland if we stayed in the Union, that we were just going to be taken for everything we had. And they had a vote in the House of Lords on Scotland's place in the Union, and we were four votes away from having it ended at that point. So, um, do, do, do you think um, the, the Lords and the nobles in Scotland maybe were divided as well. Maybe that's the reason why they didn't rebel, because you spoke about bribery earlier. It you... was... It came down to allegiances. Oh, I see. You know, um, it, it was just down to allegiances. There's going to have been ties made within that first six years mm -hmm. um, where English lords and authority were promising various um, to keep the Scottish lords and authority sweet, because they were infringing on some of the, especially when it came to taxation, suddenly Scots found themselves pure overly taxed. I mean, we took on half of England's two million pound debt on the signing of the union. So taxation just went through, the, but then they started trying to find other things to tax that um, was denied to them by the treaty. But then they're like, no, but it's for the Scots benefit because if we tax them, then we've got that money to spend on Scotland, which they didn't, you know, they just started. What? Um, so, 
What, yeah, what, Scot what? Scot Scotland from the get go was the most overtaxed, underfunded, and underrepresented part of the union, which was only really highlighted once Ireland joined in eighteen o one. So, um, you, you might be worth going into detail about that then. When when Ireland, I wouldn't say joined, I'd say forced into it would be more the case for Ireland, I think. Yeah. Um... I mean, definitely the the Irish have always been fiercely independent and and didn't want any encroachment of the Anglo centralisation that Scotland saw, um, but they actually, in fact, got a better deal out of their union than Scotland did. Um, starting with the fact that that twenty million pounds of English debt, Ireland wasn't party to that debt, um, so. They also ended up getting their institutions better funded, their universities, their arts, etc. were all better funded than Scots. They were less taxed than Scots um, and they were granted a, a better representation than Scots as well. That is but again, these yeah. are things that were given to them to keep because it was so contentious with the Irish. They almost had to give them a slightly better deal. That is surprising because you would think kind of with the, the way I think Britain treated Ireland as more of a colony, you would think it would be a lot more brutal than um, than that, if that makes sense. And obviously there, there would have been kind of uh, kind of mm. British repression in Ireland, but for them to give kind of more concessions than they gave to Scotland is a bit odd, would you say? Again, it came down to the authorities. And if you think that for longer than... It, had been so obvious in Scotland. I mean, it had been happening in Scotland too, but it was less obvious. The planting of non-Irish into Ireland oh. and the fact that so many of the the lords and nobles over there, their authorities were Protestant, uh, quite a lot were English, plants or um, and like ancestors, you know, uh, sorry, not ancestors, but descendants of English planting families you know um right okay. so they already they already had an in you know because technically their own people were already there um right. but i mean that led to obviously your your famine and that that was a a human made yeah um, so failure. I, I, I guess it'd be english lords kind of taxing english other english lords less it's just these ones were based in ireland rather than in england yeah, um, they also knew that the people in Ireland, they, they'd made it so that there there wasn't funds available from the people in Ireland. Um, the people were really oppressed, but that was quite a lot to do with the whole sectarian aspect of the fact that the Protestants were in charge, whereas a huge percentage of the general population were Catholic at the time right. in Ireland. So the taxation would um, be less on kind of the English lords in Ireland rather than just the Irish population in general, would you say? Yeah, I mean, the Irish population, they, they weren't allowed to be hired. They weren't allowed to... They, they were second-class citizens in their mm -hmm. own country purely because of their religion. Like, Ireland is a very different case than Scotland right, yeah. is. Yeah, I, I guess it would be English lords trying to treat other English lords well rather than Scotland yeah. where you had Scottish lords and nobles. So they yeah, wouldn't Scot really care about them. Scotland adopted and, and was very happy to embrace uh, the Presbyterian Protestant um, veneer after the referen uh, the Reformation. You know. okay. So we, we were less kind of got at for religion. We were on side in that way um, with the English. Right. So I guess that does bring us kind of on to representation a little bit, because you mentioned earlier, like, Scotland didn't have the representation that it wanted originally. Um, and that Scotland had, I think, around one third of the population England did, but it had much less MPs. That's right. Um, so it was initially, it was Article 22 of the Treaty of Union um, was about Scottish representation at the House of Lords, uh, sorry, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, in the House of Lords, there was only 16 Scottish peers allowed to, to join the House of Lords. But in the House of Commons, 30 was the proposed number of MPs um, to join the House of Commons with the 513 um, English MPs. 
So w when you mention right. like they're making changes to the treaties and stuff, they can do that yeah. because one act of parliament um, un undoes another, right? Well, that that was before it was ratified. The the, the this Article Twenty Two became contentious. The Scots refused to ratify the the Treaty of Union until that was dealt with. They were like, we're not signing off on this if we're only getting 30. And after a lot of negotiations and back and forth, we got 45 MPs, um, which Scots were like, do you know what? Fuck it. If, if that's all we can get, then do you know what? Let, let's run with it. Let, let's see how we can maybe change things. Um, and obviously that's way less than a third, right? That was, you would think yeah. Scotland would have gotten. Yeah. Yeah, a lot less than a third. That's less than 10 times like the the number of MPs that the English had. Um, are, are you surprised they accepted such a low number then in the end? Because obviously that's um, it, it gives them Scotland very little sway over anything. I honestly felt Scotland was pushed into, but also the fact that the Duke of Hamilton was supposed to speak on behalf of Scots and get us the best deal possible, but uh, he was he ended up being a turncoat. Um, he he was making out to the Scots that this was. The path that he was on, he wanted to help, he wanted to get his good, but um, he was a, a snake in the grass. Like, uh, on the day when he was supposed to do his bit and get up and, and make sure that we got the representation that we were after and varying other um, little amendments that the Scots wanted to see in the Treaty of Union, he, he bowed out, he was like, I'm not, I'm not coming, I've got too fake, and they dragged him. And he sat there going, so who's going to do this? I'll second whoever you choose. And they're like, you're going to do that. It, the plan has always been that you, you you accepted this role. And he went, nah, I'm, I'm not up for it anymore. And oh. fucked us. That was <laughs> like, kind so, of easy. You know, he, you know, he said, like, oh, yeah, I'll do it, guys. And then when it's, when it's time to do something, he's like, me? Who, me? No, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Who, who, who come up with this? Yeah, he made out like he was the main man. He was the man that could get Scotland the best of terms from this treaty. And then when it came to crunch, he went, I don't, don't know if I can be bothered, is, actually. Like, is it and, got um, Douglas Ross vibes? Is that, what I'm, is oh, that what I'm hearing? Oh, worse than Douglas Ross. The Duke well, Hamilton is the worst of people. He was really awful. Worse than Douglas like, he, Ross. That's crazy. He, he fucked Scotland. He fucked Scotland. He fucked negotiations from our side like, completely. Oh, so this guy, it kind of, he really did a bad job then. He sabotaged it. Yeah. And so the best you got was 45 out of what, like 500 odd uh, MPs, I think it was? We we got 45, yeah. Yeah, I think the English had about 513. Um... So when it comes to... Well, like, yeah. I mean, what, the they're going to have known, the lords that were reading over the street are going to have known that with 45 against 500 odds, how do we get anything passed for Scotland? We have to, I think, I think they were more optimistic than history should have taught them they should have been. Um, I think they felt like maybe we could be friends off the back of this union, that maybe England and the English MPs would vote for what was of benefit to Scotland. But they either didn't turn up to the votes at all, um, or they, they flat out voted against things. and. Again, Charles Waddy gives us a list of varying debates, purely, solely Scottish debates in the House of Commons. And it's a list of all of these very nothing vote, just just really basic communities people are asking for, nothing huge. They're not asking for like large amounts of money to be spent or anything. And they're just getting voted out constantly by the English faction when the Scots were as 100% of them were voting for the thing the english were just like knock that away just fuck that like, yeah there's no no veto or anything like that so it's just yeah, it's it just a almost, numbers game it was almost out of spite in some cases because a lot of them wouldn't have affected the english budget or or anything like it wouldn't have changed really anything it would have just benefited maybe a region of scotland just a little bit and the english are just like nah fuck those guys no no your place kind of votes no your yeah, place yeah out of spite or something, you know, like it was really weird to read down this list and go, why would they even vote against that? It so, must have been just because they're just like, fuck it, they're Scottish. Do you have any kind of examples of that? Like anything specific they would have voted against at hand? Um, it, do, it does sound kind of funny, like in the sense of they're just like, nah, we're not doing that. Let's have a wee look at my book here, shall we? 
we have Charles Waddy's book because I republished it. Um, so uh, we've got the first vote that they, they, he, he lists here is that county councils should have control of police. Is that just in Scotland? Yeah. Okay. Just in Scotland. And Scottish votes were 43 4, and um, we were defeated by 102 votes against by the English. Who ha who controlled the police before that then? Who, who, who would have controlled the police in Scotland at that point if, before the county councils? Be, it would have been Westminster, um, I think. There would have, it would have been, yeah, it would have been a governmental oversight. Oh, so this is kind like, of a devolved least, thing they would have wanted then? Yeah, it, initially it would have been Holyrood right. um, that took care of that in Scotland and made sure that the boroughs were police. And um, when that went to Westminster, they didn't care. Like, um, But in saying that, they did vote for um, a lot of money to be put towards the Irish police because those people needed to be kept doing you that, know that like, makes sense that that i can see yeah. I, can, I can see why they would why yeah. they would do that's one of the things thatcher did the irish people yeah it was but, police the irish people i, I think one know. of the things thatcher did was um you know give pay rises to police in london because if it pops off which it did she need the police on side yeah so yeah that, that would exactly. make sense exactly but you you had examples um like um that that was happening all the time. The the disparity of pay throughout Britain was very different. So uh, a really excellent article kind of messed up to read it. To be honest, so they're talking about a first class port, first class harbour in Scotland, and the employees of this harbour, and the fact that they got paid a half, two thirds of what the English counterparts at a second-class harbour in England would get paid. So they've put together this petition outlining the differences and why are there differences? Like, are, are we not legislated the same? You know, wh why are we getting paid less than a second-class um, staff down in England would get paid? And the return was... How how dare you petition us for more money? How dare you? And the petitioners from that harbour were reprimanded for even of even coming up with a petition in the first place. Oh, you know, you like, can't ask for a pay rise in any area. You know, it causes inflation and stuff. You know, can't. can't they weren't even that. necessarily asking for a pay rise. They were asking for pay equality. They yeah. just they're like, if I if I worked just 500 miles down the road that I would get paid double what I'm getting paid at the moment. Why? They were just questioning it. Just, what? And they yeah. all got severely reprimanded for so, having dared question such a thing. So yeah. what, what would be the difference in a first class and second class harbour if you got that, you know, like, is it terms of imports? It would or... be the, the type of vessels that they were able to oh. to accept and maintain. So um, you're talking about a skill difference as well, then, if you're talking about bigger, potentially bigger, yeah. more sh complex ships going to. Sure. That yeah, harbor. there'd be a lot more work with some of the the larger trading vessels and things. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I care about in that area is pirates, so I wouldn't know too much about ships, but they, they, <laughs> they do look at um they do look like a lot of hassle to maintain, to be honest. Like. Well, there was a French pirate called Thoreau that um, displaced about a million people from the coast of Scotland because uh, Scots were denied arms to protect themselves by Westminster. And that was the act of prescription in 1746, 1747. And um, we weren't allowed to wear Scottish clothes. It says Highland Garb, but it literally meant any article of Scottish clothing. So it didn't even have to be tartan. Um, and people often only had like maybe five changes of clothes, you know. Right. Um, so people couldn't afford to just buy a brand new wardrobe, you know. So you you ended up getting imprisoned for three years, I think, for a first offence, and then transported for seven years for a second offence. You were sent off to a, a British plantation to go and work for seven years for having dared wear your own clothing. That's one hell um, of a punishment that is. Yeah. So, but they weren't allowed to to arm themselves. 
Um, so at a time when worldwide people were armed and ready to protect what was theirs, um, England went, and nah, actually Scotland, you're exempt. And it's not as if Scot like England said, if you're under attack, we'll come to the rescue. It was just, you're not allowed to protect yourselves with arms. The only way that the men could bypass that was by joining the British Army, which oh. proved to be quite the, the enlistment tactic from Westminster for the British Army, because you join the army, you're able to wear kilts again, you're able to bear arms again. Uh, unfortunately, you're not able to protect your country because you're immediately weaked off to Crimea or or somewhere Some colony, that England yeah. was already fighting yeah. for. Plus, you have to you swear know? allegiance um, to the uh, monarch as well, so a chance of you yeah. using your weapons for nefarious tactics. It must have been a parent's dream, Scotland, then. No guards, um, free real estate. Yeah, uh, at this point, you had... Um, English coming up and kidnapping Scots. Uh, there was a huge epidemic of Scots being kidnapped um, and just dragged out as slaves to plantations. Um, yeah. They're not transported, not not legally brought out. It wasn't punishment. They were literally just kidnapped as slaves and sent off to, to work plantations. I guess, I guess, yeah, you can see that, especially with um, a plantation being a punishment for wearing um yeah. scottish clothing i guess that would, yeah you know they're then being taken as slaves like no one's going to question that um so that that i can see so in terms of uh representation um kind of scotland you, you i remember you saying um the other day, uh, when we spoke about it like they couldn't figure out how scotland's mps were calculated like the number because it wasn't based on population yeah. or um or anything like that it was just a like a small number picked out right yes so a, a lot of um, the best arguments against the union come from very pro-union Scottish nationalists that formed the Home Rule Associations at about the mid-19th century. Um, because what they were basically saying was, the union has failed us in this regard over and over again. We keep requesting this thing from Westminster that's constantly denied and we don't understand it. But what we're realising is that the lack of representation is to blame for the majority of this. The the fact that we we don't have the votes in Parliament to be able to enact legislation for ourselves, um, that it always comes down to the whims of the English side, whether or not we get a thing or not. Um, so we constantly don't, because the English are like, well, we don't care about you, why would we care? Um, so what they realised was that from the time of the signing of the Union, whether you took it by population of either country or by revenue from either country, Scotland, in all cases, was owed a good five times the amount of the MPs that we had. Um, they worked out that really we should have had 170 MPs to begin with on the signing of the Union. Um, based on population at that time, because Scotland had about 2 million, whereas England at that point only had about 6 million. So we should have had a third of the representation having a third of the, the population. Um, that that wasn't the case, of course. So but, home rule was a thing I think Irish some Irish people wanted before they, um, in the end, decided to go for Irish, um, fight for Irish independence. Do you think home rule would make, well, it would make a big difference to Scotland, but do you think um, are there any reasons why kind of Ireland went in a different direction to Scotland, if that makes sense? It didn't go in a different direction. So Scots wanted home rule from the get-go. That yeah. That's the federal union that, that I was talking about mm -hmm. that Scots wanted in the first place. Scots always wanted home rule. That's what a federal union is. Um, it's like if you look at the United States of America, every state is able to enact for itself. Every yeah. state has different laws and a different way of going about a thing. Um, and that would be how Britain would be formed. Um, Scotland would be able to deal with everything solely Scottish for Holywood. Um, Holyrood, as well as um, the I that's what Irish wanted as well. They're like, if we're going to enter into a union with you, 
we also want a federal union, but because right. England had already secured the union, it had almost an incorporating union with Scotland. They were like, listen, this is union we're offering you. Um, obviously, it didn't take very long for Ireland to be able to secure their home rule. It took about a century um, for Ireland to to obtain the whole ro home rule it was looking for. Scots were looking for it at the same time. They they had really built up a huge case for home rule um, off the back of how the union had failed for the 150 years it had come before. and But they knew that for both to secure home rule, it would have to be granted to both at the same time. That right. The Scots needed the Irish votes to be able to secure it for itself. And they knew, that they said to Gladstone and, that, and Palmerston, they were like, if you give Ireland the home rule first, like, we're not going to have the votes. They knew how it was going to go. So when they see Ireland getting home rule before that, they knew that it was it was done. And then you had the world wars that just ended everything. The world wars ended all the talk for home rule for Scotland. It, it almost wiped Scots' memories of the fact that the majority of the population, the vast majority of the Scottish population up to that point had been pro-unionist Scottish nationalists. They were pro-union on the basis that it was of benefit in some way to Scotland, and it just wasn't, um, which is why the Home Rule... Because they, they couldn't countenance the idea of leaving the union. They didn't want to abandon the union. They just wanted the union to work for every day, and yeah. it wasn't... You know, that, that, um, that makes sense. It'd be the kind of the like... world wars, that huge propaganda of we are one country, we're yeah. in this together, that can scuppered everything. Like so, the the you that's why the unionists of today in Scotland are a very different breed. You have to almost be prepared to denounce Scotland and make out like it can't survive without the union in order to be a unionist. You can't be pro Scotland and pro Scottish Union these days. That that's like two views that are anathema to each other. Indie Truck Dave and I had an argument prior to the first Sunday roast we did because he didn't believe that such people existed. I'm like, I can prove that they existed for 200 years. Let me show you the ways. And I sent him a few of the books that I'd published. And he was like, ah, oh, oh, right, okay. And he kind of understood that. Um, but the reason that that it's so different now as well and um, that the scottish nationalists are not pro-unionists is that it just kept failing and then the home rule bids the one thing that could have actually saved the union and made it so that this wasn't even a topic of conversation just now we failed in that and so the scottish nationalists of today are like we've literally tried everything we've tried everything with you guys and you have shot us down, you have laughed at us, you have you have turned deaf ears to us, and we're just done with it. We're we're just pure done with it. We're we're set on doing the thing ourselves now, um, because you've been so unrelenting um, in your kind of we detracting ways that there's just, you've burned your bridges, you know, um, much like a longer version of Brexit. You know, yeah, yeah. Like the EU is not really going to want to entertain Westminster. Scots are at that point with Westminster when it comes to self determination. Uh, I, guess, I guess it makes sense. Like people wanted a lot more auto autonomy, but to stay within the union, and the union said no. So that at that point, what can you do? That that is the one thing that would have saved the union. We we might be all sat out here in Scotland just now as pro unionist Scottish nationalists that yeah. that are just proud of our country um, and what it what it's capable of um, while appreciating any help that we get from the British Imperial Parliament, you know? That's, Whereas... That's an alt-universe I don't think anyone's ready for. Well, we've, we've spent 315 years having the English decide our matters for us. Um, devolution, I think, was a sticking plaster that, that Westminster thought that that'll knock all this nonsense out of them because the the self determination movement in Scotland only really started getting going again in the sixties, because um, again the world wars 
nixed it. So there was a whole period between, say, 1920 and the 1960s where it wasn't even really talked about. Um, people were still kind of recovering, still trying to work out how the land lay after the World Wars, I think. Um, right. And I think Westminster thought, we're going to get people to stop talking about this. Um, the idea of separate separation by giving them an inch uh, in terms of devolution. So devolution was basically what they were touting as devo mat uh, during the referendum. Devolution was, we'll give you a parliament, but we're only going to give you the the abilities that we want you to have over Scotland. You're not going to have a say over everything purely Scottish. Uh, uh, We're going to tell you which bits you get to to work with. There was obviously you know, uh, someone asking the question about the Scotland Act. That's kind of what we're talking about here, right, in terms of devolution. Um, yeah. You, you know, like, there are certain powers given, like taxation. Obviously, these powers can be revoked at any point yeah, by um, exactly. Westminster. Yeah. And I think certain... I think Tory MPs have mentioned it to, you mm -hmm. know, to take back the powers. Um, but, but some of them are demanding that devolution is scrapped. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, you because know, why would Scott have Scots have any um, say over over themselves at all? No, I guess that kind of yeah. In terms of the economic side of it, that's something we can discuss. Um, but you know, I think I agree with you to an extent. It was a sticking blaster, but I think given the differences between how, especially the Tory government that we have now. Um, mm compared to what's going on in um, Scotland, it is very different in terms of certain policies. Like um, Whenever the Tories have been in, it's been very weird for the Scots because we've never voted the Tories in. Like, not since the 50s yeah. has Scotland voted the Tories in. And even New Labour were really just Tory light. Um, and I don't feel like you are going to get much of a difference if Starmer's voted in either. Like, you can say um, use, but so long as you're part of the union, it's you as well. You know, you got to leave. Yeah, we've not really seen it in that way, though. Um, yeah. Despite the fact that a lot of Scots don't understand that the Scottish Parliament is a branch office, a lot of um, folk that are on side with Scotland regaining self-determination yeah. feel like the Scottish Parliament has the rights to just make that happen. And why are they not making it happen? And, and what's wrong with it? They don't have the right to make that happen. They're a, a branch office of it's Westminster. It's a subsidiary. It's a subsidiary of um, yeah. the Westminster government. My yeah. slightly and different I think name, a lot of Scots get quite impatient because they don't realise that that's the case. Well, to, to be fair, I think we could have mentioned it later, but you know, it's probably worth saying now. Then, you know, in, in terms of like how Scotland votes, you've got the SNP who have been elected for a while now, yeah. um, which Just definitely shows right. intent for independence. Yeah. But why haven't they been able to get a, another referendum? Obviously, there was one in, I would say it was 2014. Um, yeah. it was, I think it was narrowly lost, wasn't it? It wasn't that big a margin. No, it was 45, 55 split on it. Um, so, okay. Not super different from the Brexit vote, to be honest. Yeah, Brexit um, was a bit closer. Yeah. Um, but okay. But so... I think had the SNP leader at the time, that Salmon fella, had he held off on his vote, I think I think he was too overconfident, okay? They had been given the right by Westminster to have the referendum. I don't believe that Westminster set out the time scale for that. I don't think they said, you have to have this vote in 2014. I've not read anything to suggest that was the case. And at the time that the Scottish referendum um, was even just being talked about, um, people were having the debates, Sturgeon's um, having debates um, on the lead up to the referendum itself. She was having to constantly counter the, the better together side, the no faction side, who kept convincing people to vote no by saying, if you vote no, you're going to immediately no longer be a member of the European Union. And Nicola Sturgeon in 2013, in January of 2013, like a year and a half before the referendum even took place, is on stage saying, 
you guys are considering having a vote on our place in the European yeah. Union. So, so you can't tell us that a no vote is going to guarantee our stay in the Union. You guys are about to vote on this. So if Salmond had not decided to have the referendum in 2014, if he'd waited until 2017 or 2018 to have that vote after the Brexit vote was known, how do we think the, the referendum for Scottish self-determination would have turned out, having yeah. been taken out of the EU against our will? And that being the main argument for the no vote in 2014. I, I think I think I think he was too overconfident. Yeah, I, th I think he was, and I think the the Better Together yeah. campaign put enough doubt in kind of enough people's minds where it wasn't yeah. it wasn't clear what kind of Scotland would look like if it would be better off. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think the main driver really was the idea that we could lose our EU membership. Yeah, I, I think people were freaked out that that might be the case. That that was such a huge talking point in the, the run-up to a referendum because the EU proved itself to be beneficial to Scotland. It proved itself to be beneficial to England and Wales and, and Ireland, which is how we know that Brexit has failed, is uh, because it was a bad idea leaving all those benefits. Uh, you know? I think the other thing was, I think the Scottish government talked up the oil revenue, and I think there was a price drop in oil prior to the referendum as well like fairly close-ish um, I, I don't know if you've noticed but yeah. whenever the Scots start talking about regaining self-determination it's very strange that the oil prices suddenly drop <laughs> you guys should keep doing it we need the oil but prices very coincidental, it, you costs, know? it costs a lot you know so you guys should keep doing it yeah um, but yeah in, in terms of that in terms of devolution I guess um, I think it has kind of shown how different things can be in terms of, I think yeah. you have some areas of nationalised rail. It's way cheaper to get train travel, yeah. I think, up there. And it, it, does it run so better? Because it's not yeah. quite done. We, we, at the moment, for example, it's off-peak rates all day, every day, um, because they're trialling a thing just now. Yeah. So, yeah. They, they do have some subsidy, subsidies for buses where I am, which is actually beneficial uh, to me. But in terms of, like, for the most part, it's quite expensive to get around down here and it's not reliable. And obviously there's the uh, train strikes as well, which yeah. is um, not great at the moment. Um, we've had, obviously, the nurses strike, the, the you know, nurse and junior doctor strikes down here. I don't think that's happened in Scotland because, you know, the um, Hollywood government have tried to negotiate with the healthcare workers, right? Yeah, I mean, I work for the NHS. Um and I'm a member of the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, that's my union. And they actually put out feelers to see whether we wanted to strike for better pay. Mm -hmm. um, but the Scottish government kind of got in there like pretty quickly, to be honest. They they didn't hang back and, and just wait to see what happened. Um, they seem to have gotten there quite quickly. So I think we voted like 60, 70% not to, to strike. Yeah, um, that, that makes sense. That, that was December before last. The best way to avoid that is obviously negotiations, but the British government have... Oh, I say the Westminster government has decided not to do that. Um, they don't even faith. want to sit down for talks. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, and um, I guess... When we list off the other changes, like you've got um, cleaner water up there because you don't have the yeah. privatisation we have down here. Um, you have yeah, free prescriptions. Um, the highest spending per capita on education as yeah. well, which is something that I'll And on the on NHS, screen. we get yes. far higher spending on NHS. There's higher salaries uh, Which is why well. so many of the English doctors end up up here with us. Yeah. Um, I mean, where I work, there's so many English nurses. that I, I work in a nurse-led or organisation uh, NHS 24 and there's so many English nurses that I mm -hmm. work with um, and members of staff and admin and things that uh, I don't know that they came up here because of the wage but it, it's a surprising amount um, that we've stolen from you so to speak stolen <laughs> that's mean anyways Enticed. <laughs> I guess the real question yeah. is could all of this be done without the broad shoulders of the union that's the question. Well, Scotland is That's... doing it without the broad shoulders of the union. Scotland's I... earning X amount a year. The 100% of the X amount is 
squeaked off to the Westminster Exchequer and then we're getting a very small amount set back and told this is what you have to do you for the next year. So even working under those budgetary circumstances, the Scottish Government have been able to, um, alongside obviously their ability to, to tax differently, I think Scotland has about six tax bans. Yeah, yeah it does, yeah. it's got a few more, yeah. Um, yeah, and so it's it's fairer taxation based on what you're earning. If you earn more, you will pay more tax. There aren't cuts just because you're a big business. Yep. Uh, and that that also goes uh, towards the the budget. Um, that they spend very wisely in Scotland in terms of mitigating Westminster effects. They they mitigate a lot of the cost of living. Um expenses that, that folk are being crippled by down so south. You know. If we look at some of the kind of, I think, I guess this would be the key kind of economic argument, and there is some kind of pushback on it. I've seen from certain people, I'll do, oh my god, I'll hit the share screen on it so you can see mm -hmm. um, what I'm looking at. So this is the thing we kind of discussed the other day, you know, they discuss, that this would be the broad shoulders of the union right here. Is it running? Can you see yeah. it? Okay, cool. Um, so that you know the argument of this um, Scotland's government, you know, um, I guess not running a budget surplus. This would be the broad shoulders of the union here, um, and I think this article, this is in the Scottish government page, but I'm not sure if this is from like the Westminster. Scottish government, because of how the finances are set up by mm -hmm. Westminster, aren't able to to take on debt. Yeah. So I, I guess they're the not argument... able to. I guess the argument they would make is like that it's the Westminster government covering it. They do factor in the North Sea oil revenue here, but the problem is, all of this oil it's controlled by I think it's the Crown, and the Crown have privatised it. It's gone to like BP and Shell and those sorts of companies, and so obviously it doesn't it doesn't really allow the Scottish um, government to benefit from the oil like Norway has, because obviously an independent Scotland could right. choose to privatise it, or which is more likely yeah. they would kind of nationalise it via a company. Yeah, um, yeah, so what was I going to say? It's like I don't know how to phrase it. Scotland is has such a republican population that on the event of obtaining the full resumption of self-determination of separating yourselves from Westminster control. I would think that it wouldn't be very long before we had a vote on whether we maintain the monarchy mm -hmm. in Scotland. And it's that's not going to be a yes vote. Um, sure. Pe people up here, are, we don't care. Um, I think it might have been a different case had all this happened prior to Liz dying. I think people had more of an emotional connection to her, the fact that she'd been queen for the majority, if not all, of their lives. Um, whereas they see Charles as just a bit thick and dubious with his ties to your Jim will fix it and you've got Prince Andrew um, and the Epstein things That's and there's just a lot of yeah. dubiousness yeah. around uh, the present royal family. Let's um, let's leave anything um, dodgy out of this one because yeah I, well, I can't stand that geezer. Um, but so, it, yeah. But in getting rid of the the crown, it would open up a, a lot of land mm -hmm. to be um, what we the Scottish government would likely enter negotiations with the crown in reobtaining um, quite a lot of land, um, some of the resources etc. That, that's under crown purview, um, and. I think that would be a good thing. I think that would also benefit Scotland yeah. and open up um, more finances to Scotland. Um, if we gain self-determination, we have the opportunity to scrap the monarchy and scrap that funding. We've got 100% of our money suddenly to work with. And it's a government in Scotland that's used to working on a really strict budget. Yeah. So just 
the idea of what could be done with even double the amount that we get, much less 100% of it, would be crazy to see. It would be really interesting um, and exciting to see what kind of projects were, were kind of started. Um, again, the, in the oil thing, refine the oil, we yep. could restart the steel in industry, we could um, just inject money into to having Scotland do for itself more than it does at the moment. With, with um, this, especially after the Thatcher cuts, you know, to a lot of industry, yeah. you know. With, with the 9% figure as well, that's been widely criticised by Richard Murphy, which I'll talk about in a sec. But it doesn't, you know, like, countries running a deficit isn't that bad a thing. Like, it is higher than the rest of the UK, but, like, it's not that much higher. It's about 4% higher. How is that possible? Hmm? How is it possible when we don't have the option to operate outside the budget we're given? I, 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 I guess it it's, it's done by revenue, I guess. It's how much Scotland brings in yeah. versus how much Scotland spends. Uh -huh. That, that's all it How is, is like. it possible when we are only given X amounts and we can't spend more than that budget? I guess Th it's, there's it's no way. Family, yeah. th th this is th yeah. this is what people keep countering this deficit yeah. argument with is you don't have an argument for a deficit Th in Scotland is... because we don't have the chance to, you know? In, in terms of, yeah, the criticism of it, this is an argument I had with someone I mean, and they did post right. this by Richard Murphy, yeah. And uh, Murphy does criticise these numbers quite heavily. Um, he mm. doesn't offer his own numbers and he says it's impossible to do so because of, like, he doesn't have, I don't think he's got the, the you know, like, the, the access to the data he would need. Um, bear with me one sec, it's going to be me flicking around on the page a bit. But he goes, Jez does not account, um, it's not about the accounts of the Scottish government, nor is it about the account of the Westminster government in Scotland. There is no entity that exists in Scotland that embraces both these things. And he goes into a bit of detail here, but, you know, effectively he argues that Jez doesn't make sense. The aim of Jez is to enhance public understanding of fiscal issues in Scotland. The primary objective is to estimate a public sector account for Scotland. But, you know, he's arguing it doesn't, like, it's not it doesn't work basically right. and so that means the the number of the nine percent doesn't make sense either if that makes sense so on this subject okay so yeah. let, let's assume that scotland has a huge deficit yeah. right let's assume that on ending the union not only are we going to be landed with like whatever debt we've accrued through whatever deficit that but let's suggest that even after ending the Treaty of Union, we're still responsible for half of England's debt as per the Treaty of Union, right? Let, mm -hmm. Let's just assume that for, for talking point's sake, okay? So Scotland leaves the Union with a bunch of debt saddled to it, right? There was a QC, Ian Hamilton, who I love just the bones of him, he's just the best guy. He was one of the guys that um, went down and liberated the uh, Stone of Desti Destiny, the Stone of Scone, you know, when he was at uni. Um, but he sits and he does this nice, beautifully succinct wee video called Who Owns Big Ben, right? So he's saying that, okay, so say, say Scotland leaves with huge debt, right? If we're taking on half of England's debt, we also take on half of their assets, right? right? The assets to which we've been signatory to, which would include Westminster. So we, if we own half of debt, we also own half of Westminster, right? Now, England actually can't afford to buy back our half of Westminster, right? It can't. It, it doesn't have the money to be able to afford that on its own which would mean that Scotland would then have the ability to sell our half to whatever interested party wanted it. China, Russia, Germany. Uh, I don't Does any other are government, are, are they interested? I, I don't <laughs> think Russia at the moment have got the facilities for that, but <laughs> no, I, I guess there's a, there's a difference between debt. You get what I'm saying? Uh, there, yeah, yeah, there's a difference between debt and deficit. Obviously, uh, Murphy kind of does point out, sure. that, yeah, the whole the whole thing doesn't make sense in terms of the way assets are registered, like the money is registered in kind of Southeast England. Um, yeah. Further to that, like, you know, if you do manage to take back some of the royal sites, like they, they will most likely become UNESCO heritage sites. And I can tell you they are some of, UNESCO heritage sites are some of the best places you'll ever visit. Like, it would actually in Scotland, it would yep. be um, Heritage Scotland or the National Trust for Scotland would likely take yeah, over. But it, yeah, exactly under the same yep. kind of idea. And you'll pay like a certain amount. I think mm -hmm. UNESCO Heritage is just like a status they give. 
like it'll be under a different company or whatever but it's kind of just a title that's given certain areas like yeah. women palace um that was one that was really cool going there um the castle pride castle was really cool as well um so like th there would be a lot of places where scotland can do that too and those are really good for tourism and with oh, scotland we've already being got able to, so many yeah. I mean, we've been getting out and about to see as many of them as possible and, with the Aki's tours, you know. And, and what is hilarious is, like, it's not really talked about Scotland in terms of, like, for tourism. I think that's one of the things they can push, especially if they manage to get back some of the royal places, because those are really cool to be able to, like, actually walk into, not, like, stand outside at the gate like a loony. Um, Sc Scottish culture and history is worth a lot of money on the world stage. Yeah. For and, sure. Because, I mean, that that's off the back of Sir Walter, Walter Scott and Robert Burns, like, really romanticizing and promoting scotland and its culture and heritage you know you, you also have a lot of the trade that scotland does via dover port and i think those are registered as kind of more british exports rather than being a english to exports. scotland yes yes english exports yeah it, it'd be it'd, i think it'd be like the west you know the total they put in like Brit british yeah. i think that's what they would call whereas, it whereas yeah. outside of the union it just passing our border into england that that would be the point at which it left Scotland and we would get a return yep. for it rather it, it, than yeah. it just is transported down to England and at that point it leaves from the English port, the mm -hmm. English border, and the return is brought into England in that case. But this is, um, the it, return would come to Scotland on it leaving Scotland. It would be registered as like leaving, like as a yeah. Scottish export rather than anything else. And yeah. that's I think that's one of the other things he does talk about um, in, in kind of the articles he's published, which mm -hmm. is it's just the metrics that are used for Scotland don't make sense. Um, I think there was someone else saying like the amount of bourbon like that's registered as England buying doesn't make sense because it's a ridiculous amount. But obviously it goes it goes via England to the other ports. Um, it will go to Europe via England rather than, um, you know, and, and be classed as a British export rather than a Scottish one, which does skew yeah. the numbers quite a lot. Um, it does, yeah. So in terms of like, th that's what I think he says when he talks about the, the metrics just being off. So how can you calculate a 9% deficit when you don't take that into account? And also the fact that Scotland can use the money from North Sea oil to build renewable energy, and that creates another revenue source. Yeah. So like, yeah, I mean, Scotland's already got the potential in um, renewable energy sector to a point where we can do for ourselves without having... We, we can fully power Scotland yeah. with what we've got in the, at the moment. Um, and we've only really just started getting going with the, the renewable sector. And, and, and even um, if you, so that has a lot yeah. of potential. And you obviously you got the offshore wind, which you'd get a, a lot of. Yeah. But I think that nine percent figure as well. That's a that's a Brexit Scotland as well. That's a one that's left the EU. Yeah. Whereas what would one which look like? Would not remain the case. Yeah. What it would it look remain... like inside the EU or inside EFTA? What would? Yeah. What would that look like? Especially when we... the, the ports would have to get a lot bigger as well because yeah. it'd be stuff coming into Scotland rather than New you know, via Dover. Would be negotiated and, and set up. Um, especially, I think with Scandinavia, yeah. Um, I think a lot of new routes would um, be set up. But um, in terms of like oil, I mean that's what the Macron report was based on was really to investigate um, how oil changed things in terms of the Scottish finances and uh, the result of the Macron report, which was a Westminster back report it was a westminster backed investigation and um, the it ultimately concluded that scotland was embarrassingly and it said embarrassingly wealthy um when it comes to to oil and this was a report that came out in the 70s um that scotland would do exceedingly well on the world stage should we to regain our self-determination etc but Westminster um hushed up this report so once it was concluded they hid it they didn't want it getting out because they were trying everything they could to stop talks of regaining the self-determination and they felt like this was only going to serve to bolster a yes vote come a an independence referendum in Scotland, so they they hushed that shit up. So, so I think they, they that under wraps a lot, you know. Uh, but they they do that all the time in really stupid little ways. Like 
Outlander, the series, that had to be pushed back. The premiere of um, the first season of Outlander had to be pushed back because they felt like it would have an effect on the referendum. They, they, they just keep doing this shit because they have a goal and the goal is to keep Scotland and the finances and the resources tied up with Westminster and Sorry. under quite a bit of Westminster authority. I, I, I think I think the economic argument is a lot weaker than it was, especially um, about 10 years ago. Like, I don't think it holds very well at all. Like, I think before you could make it a lot stronger, but going through over a decade of austerity and a lot of mismanagement and, a, a, you know, a, a union that is struggling, um, especially economically, I, I don't think... I don't think that economic argument's as strong as it once was. What, what, and, and what o- but then oil's not also as important as it once was either. Um, I mean, what the Scottish government should start focusing on is storage um, for the energy, energy storage, because yeah. we're producing so much. Um, and again, we've really just got started. Um, but we're not, I don't believe we've got the capability to be able to store well, we need to start to be able to then export energy to England or Ireland or Europe. Or I guess, you know, guess it would be done via the if they big th- build those big um, cables, they can build like um, cables to transport it. Like I think that's what France does yeah. with England. They have, it like, can be done. Like so, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, like, yeah. I mean they transport possible. they transport liquid gas from Qatar all the way to Germany. Like yeah, it is pretty nuts the stuff that they can they can do with um, exporting energy, especially nowadays. Um, but yeah, I think we kind of tackled, I think, the economic side of it. Um, there is obviously the political side of it with um, kind of, it's very hard to make the political argument, I think, that Scots could not run, the, you know, Scotland could not be an independent country. Like, I know there's a quote from one uh, person, we mentioned it before, where is it gone? So uh, There it is. Scots are not genetically programmed to make political decisions. This was the uh, former leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Labour Joanne Party. Lamont. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the SNP have really debunked that quite aggressively, like in terms of spending, like you mentioned earlier, the highest spending, uh, I think, on the healthcare um, in the union. But you also have the highest education spend as well, um, followed by Northern Ireland, which is really weird. Northern Ireland's like second. I wouldn't have expected that. And then London third, but obviously the costs in London are a lot higher than they are in um, the rest of like everywhere. So that would make sense um, because the wages are higher in London. Well, it's the the right wing, um, more than anything, that <clears throat> try to uh, keep as much control. And things things need to stay the same, you know. Um, mm. Like they're they're they don't seem to be very aggressive when it comes to the right wing. Um, a, quite a large talking point within right wing factions is the kind of libertarian argument. Yeah. That, um. They just they want government out of the thing. They think that um, people should be able to do for themselves. Uh, that there should be less oversight, etc. That small governments are the way forwards, um, etc. But they think that way because local legislation works. That if a faction is overseeing its own area, its own people things are done better. Things are provided that may not have even occurred to a larger, further away administration. You know, local legislation almost always works better, um, especially when your services are publicly owned rather than privately owned. Yeah. Um, Because privately owned, again, means an entity that isn't there, that's not in with the people it's an outside external possibly far away entity that doesn't give a shit as long as it's making money which is what westminster is to us it's like a private company overseeing scotland when our own people could just do it better you know like yeah i mean when you when you look at some of the results the only thing that i think did kind of people did levy at um sturgeon was like the education results but i think we went over this the other day as well like this graph is a bit more deceiving than it looks but it's fairly Mm. close um like it's not it's not that different i think like yeah you know the uk overall is higher than scotland is in certain areas but most of it's within like a few points and 
Like it's but, but st staying, staying tied to England and the Union isn't going to affect how good or how bad education is I in guess, Scotland. I, I guess. But the, if I we can... had more money to inject into education, possibly that would make a difference. I, I but guess... that can only be done self-determination i guess the argument there is like you know scotland does have power of education like the, the mm. hollywood government does have power of education and mm. they haven't done a lot with it but to be fair how long have the snp been in charge of scotland about i think was it 2010 they won over it's been a while is it since 2010 since before i even got into politics yeah i would say it's probably been about that long yeah so yeah you would hope to see better results i guess but like it's not that bad no, I'll tell you. I, again again we might have control over our education. We don't have control over the financing of these. We only have a certain budget to be yeah. able to split up between everything that needs funded. Whereas yes. if we have full control of all of our budget, all of our money, all of our revenue, then maybe you'd see those numbers change because yeah. there'd be the money to actually enact change. You know? Yeah, probably would. But you know, like I said, they do spend, Scotland does spend the highest per capita in terms of mm. on education but i guess you know we don't know if this stuff factors in things like private schools and stuff like that um so i, I mean I guess, they've got the yeah. priorities right like that's when true. it comes to their budget you even you can see for yourself it's got the highest spending yeah. on education on health on blah, blah. they have their priorities right they're not taking their their money and putting it into track and trace that doesn't work yeah. or ppe uh, that doesn't work or just spaffing billions off to kind of pals they need to keep yeah, sweet. Yeah. You know? I, I guess the They're, other thing is we don't know what the, the starting point is. We've budgeted yeah. with those priorities for so long when we get an injection, a huge injection of our own money to, to be able to use. Mm -hmm. Why would they not maintain the same priorities? That's true. Know? And I guess with Scotland having such good universities, well, you could produce a lot more teachers. Um, and you could really push, push. Um, you could really push. Better like, paid depends. teachers. Like, oh, let's yeah. not get ahead of ourselves here. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess having more teachers will help take the workload off other ones as well. And maybe, just maybe, your education system, maybe the education system will produce people who think Scots can actually uh, make political decisions. Because evidently, I think the SNP, for the most part, have shown they can make political decisions. Why this yeah. person made this dumb comment, I do not know. Because uh, of Labour, you know, I can tell you why. We've already discussed why. The pro-unionists in Scotland are not allowed to be pro-Scotland. Yeah. What's you that? have to. You have to believe that Westminster funds Scotland. That the union keeps Scotland afloat. You have to believe that to be a unionist in Scotland. There, there's no other. You, you don't get a different kind of unionist here. That. They, all believe that, and you've got Paul Sweeney. Paul Sweeney, I think he's a, he's a Labour guy. He came out recently as well, saying Scotland is funded by London-generated wealth to the tune of ten billion a year. No, it's not. It's London-generated in the way that the money came from Scotland, and then we got a little slice of it back. Yeah. So London has generated it by taking it from us before going, okay, there's your portion. Okay. so We're not funded by Westminster. We're funded by a pittance of our own money. So, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, I'm just trying to remember topics. Um, so in terms of that, like, we've done the economic side of it. I think the, the, the whole argument of Scotland would run a deficit. I think England, you know, the, most countries run a deficit anyways. Like, it's about what you do with the money. And like you said, like, if Scotland borrows money to invest in, I don't know, offshore wind, that generates a return rather than giving it to Dido Harding, which generated a return of more COVID. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess it just depends on what your goals are at that point. Um, I mean, yeah, like Scotland took on half of England's debt on the condition that the interest was to be paid off yearly at the very least, right? Mm -hmm. um, Westminster reneged on that immediately. It, the interest was never paid in full. It wasn't even half paid up until the end of the 19th century. So that national debt we see now comes off the back of that original debt that Westminster just decided to ignore. Like, fuck it. What are they using their money for? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, that's like, not the, well. All your your home rulers at the end of the 19th century did the sums and and found out 
to what extent Scotland was being robbed over a 60-year period from 1861 to 1891. Um, I have a book for this. Yeah, we because don't do I want down to, here. We don't deal with experts I want or to, reading. I want to get my numbers right because the numbers are high. So it was worked out that in that period of time, Scotland had been overtaxed, and this is in comparison to England and Ireland in the Union. We had been overtaxed by £92,684,319. We had been underfunded, again using the same comparisons, by £39 million which gave an aggregate loss over those 30 years of £131,684,319, which the Bank of England's inflation ca calculator has today, equaling £13,768,988,187.44 that Scotland got robbed of for the last 30 years of the 19th century and then we got oil in the latter half of the 20th century things did not get better for scotland the, there was a reason that they stopped publishing the reports annually in the papers as to how much the countries of the union were giving to the westminster exchequer because it used to say scotland gives this much ireland gives this much england gives this much and they stopped having they stopped publishing that at the start of the 20th century because it was becoming too embarrassing at how much more Scotland was paying annually than the other countries. So yeah, that's... things haven't got better, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that, and um, yeah, it's just uh, at least you know, you've done well with the resources been given rather than. Um, you know, I, I don't know how great it was under um, Labour, but based on conversations I've had with people, um, Scottish Labour did not do that good a job. Uh, I love Scottish. I loved Richard Leonard. He was my favourite Scottish Labour leader. Jim Fundley Mundley Murphy was one of the worst. Kezia Dugdale was kind of funny. Um, I think her dad and her wife were SMP, so like we'd get the odd tweets um, that were quite funny. Um, but Richard Leonard was a fucking gift to the Scottish Parliament. He would stand up at every First Minister's questions and say, Scottish Government needs to get on top of this thing that's failing. What have you to say about this? And Nicola would stand up every single time and go, that's not devolved to Scotland, that's reserved to Westminster. If you join us and help us get self-determination, we'll be able to tackle that and, and make that a bit better. But you need to join it every single time. He was, was his, such a gift at the ways in which the union was failing us. Like, what, what huh? was his? What was his kind of response to that? Oh, he just—he would just look really embarrassed. He was red-faced a lot. You know, his own people would be uh, back at Nicola Sturgeon as if she was like talking shite. Yeah, yeah. But we we can't we can't do anything about what is a reserved issue. We have we have no control. <laughs> like yeah, we, yeah, we've been yeah. told under no certain terms by Westminster, you don't deal with this, we we'll, we deal uh, with this. Uh, so when one of their own is standing up going, <laughs> this is failing, and the Scottish government's like, that's not something that we can actually do anything about. Help us do something about uh, it. They're like, no. Nah. I think that's some of the stuff they asked Sturgeon about um, around the COVID time, and she was like, that's a devolved yeah. power. Like, I can't do that. All the time. Yeah. All yeah. the time. When it came down to borders and the stuff that every other country was taking under control, Scotland had no control over the the prices that other countries were putting, the, the implementation other countries were putting in place to be able to protect their populations. Yep. Because of Westminster, Scotland wasn't able to do that for itself. It was, it was yeah, it was, there, there was not a lot of that Scotland could do. I think even, even Ireland was hampered by Northern Ireland, to be fair, in terms of yeah. The, yeah, what they could actually do to deal with it, because you share a landmass and like a, an open border. 100%. So, and that, that's just another way in which the, the unions fail in Scotland because we want a population. We want to add to our population. We want to attract people to come and live here and take up 
like employment and schooling and we want people here but Westminster Westminster's Tory constant rhetoric against immigrants um which makes a lot of people abroad go why would we ever move to Britain to have to deal with all that racist yeah. shite you know so we've got the the veneer of racism that's been put on us by Westminster but we've also got the the anti-immigration like effects and legislature legislature that stop us from being able to to bring in the workers that we want and the population that would bolster Scotland so we that would be something that would be tackled after yes. self determination that yes, that yes. would be something that would be focused on would be building houses and obtaining a population for Scotland from elsewhere. It's know? kind of the needs of England being put first because obviously England has the most amount of MPs, so it has the most uh, uh, say over things. And when you've Always got, like, in the case. That's how this yeah. conversation started. Yeah, and Always when, you've got, in the case. when you've got a bunch of clowns in charge like we do now and a bunch of clowns in opposition, it's not going to change a lot because people in England don't like immigration. Everything. They don't want more immigration. Means- absolutely everything at Westminster yeah. if we had better representation maybe we wouldn't have been as overtaxed as we have been maybe we wouldn't have been underfunded as we have been there was a period in Westminster where they were talking about funding the universities throughout the UK um, Ireland got funding to the tune of, I think it was about 2000 per university um, no it was more than that I think they got about 10,000 per university England got the same or more, and Scotland had applied for its universities to also get grants um, at the same time. Uh, the Scottish application kept getting bit by the way, and and then one of the the speakers in the the House of went, "We don't feel like you've put this in in time, so uh, we could give you two thousand per university." Was, was the speaker but honestly, important? we're not even going to do that. So Scots were left going, well, give us the 2,000 at least for a university. And it, they ended up actually not getting anything what? when Ireland and England got all their universities. So th- this, yeah, th- this would have been pre-Irish um, independence, I'm guessing. This would have been a, yeah, this, a is the, this is about 1857. Okay. What yeah. was, the, was the speaker an ancestor of Lindsay Hoyle, do you think? No, I don't know. <laughs> But what, He's what, a god, okay. isn't he? Like, oh, don't get me started. Bring back no the one man before. Him. We liked the yeah. man before. Order, like, he didn't order, order. Like... order. <laughs> bring him back. But yeah, bring him back. What would you yeah. What would you say then to the you know discuss the political side of it? I guess with Scotland having a lot less representation and it's just kind of it is England dominated. Um, to be honest, like, uh, what would you make to the comparisons of Brexit and Scottish independence, given what we have talked about? Well, people are seeing the effects of Brexit. I mean, you can go probably not even five streets uh, in Glasgow and you're going to come across another building that's got EU funded, like, plaques on them, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, projects all over the place that were EU funded. Um, Brexit was so detrimental because the European Union was so beneficial. Not only were we represented to a greater extent than many of the countries within the European Union, we were one of the top five um, in the EU. We had a proper place at the table. We could make changes and um, and have a voice that was heard within the European Union. Um, we got so much funding for so many things. There was the free travel and free trade which just made life so easy when it came to working or schooling or just traveling and seeing a bit of the world. Um, Life was sunnier in the European Union because it held so many benefits for us. Yeah. And the fact that we have lost those benefits is what's making Brexit so detrimental and so obviously detrimental. Um, because we're starting to reap the what we've what Westminster have sown, we're we're starting to see the the fact that we can't afford oh. to to do as many of this, especially in terms of science um, projects. We're we're oh, not the, involved yeah, um, in the same Horizon. scale as we, Horizon, we had. Yeah. We're not involved in the same 
way as we had been um, and Scottish self-determination is off the back of the fact that the, the British Union has proved itself to only be detrimental to Scotland, that whenever we have tried to make it equal, whenever we have tried to have a voice within the Union or a seat at the table, um, we've been just knocked back, uh, ignored, um, deaf ears turned to us. Um, we've been laughed out of Parliament. Uh, I think, was it Angus Robertson stood up and said uh, the majority of Scots feel like Scotland's oil should be under Scotland's control. And David Cameron stood up, waited for the laughter to finish before saying, ask a stupid question. And then the laughter continued. Yeah. The, we're not taken seriously. We've never been taken seriously um, by the British Union. We've always just been something that England has taken control of and they'll make use of us however they want to make use of us, you know? And whenever we can be of use to them, they'll make sure that we're going to bloody be there, you know? Um, if they want water piped down from Scotland, they're going to get water piped down from Scotland. Is there going to be cost of Westminster? No, we're a union, you know? So, um, it, yeah, I, hmm? I, I was just going to say, I really don't get the argument that you can compare the two anyways. Like, the, the whole Brexit argument was based in hmm. sovereignty, which which didn't exist scottish independence actually gives scotland sovereignty um so i, I don't i don't really get it i mean if yeah. they're gonna argue about the economic damage scott independence scotland do like we've covered that like there's no there's no way you can even measure that not really given the fact that the only metric we have is deeply flawed and there's we a lot of stuff that's not been taken into account in terms of um ways scotland can generate revenue okay, so again yeah. that doesn't make sense as well even like, not being in like, even not having the, the exact numbers to hand, the fact is we only get a small cut of what we give to the Westminster coffers. So if we were to suddenly have 100% of our revenue, how could that be more detrimental to Scotland? How could we be poorer as a result of that? It doesn't make sense. The sums don't make sense. Even not knowing the number we're starting off with, we're seeing what we can do with the small amount we get back from Westminster. So even getting half of what we send to Westminster is going to be better. So surely getting 100% to ourselves is just positive. It's There's no downsides to that, yeah. you know? Uh you can't say you're going to be worse off because of that. It's not possible. Uh, I think. You know? uh, I think with the border question as well, like you still have, like you can have a system like the common travel area, which Ireland has um, with the UK. Like, so I don't think immigration, like in terms of travel, would be a big problem. Uh, no. Trade would be a question mark depending on how strong the Scottish ports are. But again, like, it's, it, uh, is either side going to stop? The fact. Yeah, it is. Uh, is either side going to really like try and impact the other side's trade with the other that much? Given like England's food security is really bad. To the point where but, we're having to change our import um, checks because of uh, Brexit. Like, it was trade fights that got us into the roped into the union in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it was England's just England's Alien Act was literally put in place despite the fact it was costing wet, like the English Parliament so much money to police it. They were spending hand over fist in a bid to try and police these Scottish foreigners that were on English soil because of their own alien act. You know, like, it was crazy. Like, they had to, goods from Scotland or from England into Scotland were, like, were stopped. So they had to police that, you know, because there wasn't to be trade to, between the two Scotland, between that's, the two countries. That's you know? crazy, you know, a country putting their yeah. economic interests because of political reasons. That's crazy. I've never Purely heard of because of they didn't want Scotland being able to have the trade that they did. You they, would... they that that was why like they scuppered Darien. That's why they got the king involved in scuppering Darien was because they couldn't the idea of Scots being able to trade as effectively as the English were, they couldn't they couldn't get their head around that. They didn't yeah. want to, to see that, you know? So English jealousy led to the Alien Act. 
for each led to them having to oh. spend so much. They, they would literally shoot themselves in the foot just to enact against Scotland. Oh. And this is the faction we got into union with. And it's yeah. been the same since. It's the oh. same faction. It's it's descendants of the same faction that seem to be operating the same kind of policies. So I believe that should we get self-determination, I think there is going to be a period of instable relations between the, the two countries until things settle. Yeah. Like, I think but... there is going to be a period where it's everything's a bit kind of shaky, a wee bit, uh, like, and everyone's going to have to be very diplomatic for a wee while. Um, but all that will settle down. I, I think you that's, know. Normal. that's normal after any country kind yeah. of leaves, like a union or like gets independence. Like, it's always yeah. um, pretty, like, weird at first. Um, I think the hope is from every time the the British have lost a colony, I think there's been the hope that they were going to see that country fail as a result. I think there was the expectation, because I think that the Westminster folk believe their own gump. I think that they believe that Scotland is only able to exist because of the broad shoulders of the yeah. Union. I, I think that they believe that, despite the fact that it's a lie that has been touted in a bid to keep Scots on side with the Union and to maintain uni unionism within Scotland, it's also having the opposite effect in England because the English are hearing the same lie, but the English are saying, why are we funding yeah. them having free prescriptions? Why are we funding them having baby boxes? Why are we funding free education, free university ex education? Why are we funding this? Can we not get just get rid of them? It's, it's and I'm of... in the belief that that lie alone, if the referendum for Scottish self-determination was to be taken Britain-wide, I think we would see a yes vote off the back of the English looking to get shot of the people that are apparently costing them anything. You know? I, I, think, I think that would be a bit ropey. I th I, I'm not sure... That I don't know. I like think that. it would be I, interesting, I to be honest. I, I think it would be. I'd be interested to see it. But yeah. I think it kind of... It goes back to, you know, the old argument of the white man's burden. Like, you know, like these countries can't run themselves, well, therefore we have to run it. But like, yeah, like you yeah. said, like if it's if it's true, Scotland's a financial burden. Why don't we just let it go? Like, I mean, you, I mean, see, the EDL are not so far removed from Farage's UKIP lot. Are not so far removed from the Tories, um, and they really aren't fans of Scotland. Like they, they think that we're like kind of annoying we upstarts that every time we've gone to parliament to ask for something that even something that england already has in place um they're like look at them fucking, i'm asking for shit again fuck these people <laughs> i think i think it's yeah it's the idea of like why can't we don't have these things why should you have them or why are we paying you to have these things like we've seen like yeah. it's what they use against like um people who might immigrate here or people who seek asylum here it's like oh i can't have this and you should have nothing um, yeah. Your yeah, yeah, yeah. How dare you? Of, yeah. yeah, and it's kind of they put kind of put that on Scotland. Like I did listen to like a conversation between Rory Stewart and Caroline Lucas about it, and like the the arguments Rory Stewart used like oh, you can't really separate England and Scotland like that. I'm like, bro, what are you talking about? Like, what what is it? Kind of, <laughs> it's that old. I think it is partly they won't call it anymore, but it's the old white man's burden mentality. Even though Scotland is obviously, you know, people are white there. It's kind of like the idea of, oh, they can't look after themselves. It's our responsibility to look after them. When it's like, it's dumb. Like that didn't work for the colonies. Yeah. It doesn't work for any other country. Like you can't govern like that. It's very um, patronizing, I'd say. We we didn't have to be a different color. Um, a good proportion of the population um, up to the Union spoke Gaelic. And that was enough to make them of yeah. no use to England, you know. Um, in 1606, no, 1616, you had the Education Act for Scotland, and that was to put schools in every parish. But the point of that wasn't to make sure the kids were educated. I mean, it did that, 
and cheers for that. But um, it was purely just to make sure that they could speak English. They had to be able to read the Bible in English um, before they were allowed to go. Uh, and then in 1696, uh, that act was enforced. Um, and it wasn't just that they had to read the Bible, they had to be conversational in England in English because what they were realising was the kids could learn how to say the words that they were reading. It didn't necessarily mean that they understood yeah. the words that they were saying. So they had to be conversational in English at that point. And you had people come up with like the statutes out of Iona and things, the, the kind of idea that once a kid could speak enough English, um, they would be sent down to the lowlands or the north of England to finish their schooling. And that was in an attempt to anglicise the, the Gaelic population of Scotland because the kids would then go back to their family having experienced a different way of life and culture, speaking a different language, and the parents would then have to catch up with their ways yeah. just to be able to interact with their own children. Um, you know, it, that, that was... That was the UK's centralising tactic um, before the union even got going. Um, yeah, you, know, with... you see that with other countries, like Russification was one where they try and like get rid yeah. of other languages and bring yeah. it into one the native common Indians, language. The, the Native Americans in Canada and the US as well, they experience exactly the same thing. Oh, yeah. fucking hell, that's a, that's a different conversation. That's a, that's a really dark topic, it's, that one. It's all the same tactics that are used. Yeah. That, that, that stuff is really dark, some of the stuff that happened over there. Um, yeah. So if you can talk Same about, yeah, yeah, true. Um, kind of the importance of self-determination. Would you say like um, for a country to be able to decide its own fate, or I guess a people to be able to decide their own fate? Like, what would you say is the importance of that? I mean, it means everything, doesn't it? Like being able to do for yourself, and um, not having to rely on someone telling you what you can or can't do, what you can or can't spend. I mean, in any other situation, that would be classed as an abusive relationship. That's true, yeah. And like, why do you think unionists don't get, you know, why do you think unionists keep arguing for the union of the importance well, of it? What What do you think that is? Like, in terms of, it's not just like an economic or a political thing. It's like a, like an identity thing, almost. Yeah, it's an emotional argument. They have to go to emotional arguments when it comes to unionism in Scotland because there aren't any good arguments for unionism in Scotland um, because the union is so detrimental to Scotland. The problem with the unionists is that while the SNP and the Scottish Government are doing really good things in terms of mitigating the, the worst of the effects from Westminster, you know, the, the cost of living and everything, um, by being able to to give us free prescriptions, all the things we've talked about previously. The unionists are living in a country where they're getting these mitigating tactics um, all over the place. Like, as part of daily life, they're experiencing these mitigating tactics, but they're not seeing it as that. So what do you mean On by their that? side, all it's doing is lessening the harmful impacts of the union so that the unionists are almost unable to see some of the worst impacts of the union because they're not having to experience them because of the Scottish government. But I would be interested in what would happen if Westminster was just to go, do you know what? We're done with Scotland trying to to get what it wants out of this. We're done with them like trying to legislate for themselves. We've seen what they're trying to do with the, the hate crime bill or the, you know, the whole trans yep. kind of bill. And, and they're like, no, fuck it. We're going to take back legislation. We're going to scrap devolution. We're, we're just taking Scotland back under our wing again. Like, years, years have lost your parliament. Like, He's... Um, if we were suddenly to have to live by what people in England are experiencing and the costs and expenses and the privatisation that the English experience, I think the unionists in Scotland would be harder pushed to be able to even have that emotional 
argument for the union because at the moment they're like the union's not that bad you know in what ways is it hurting us we get all this free yeah. prescription yeah. and baby box and free educate it's like that's not the union that's doing that for you it's the scottish government that's doing that for you but they see it as the union has allowed the scottish government yeah. to do that for us um that that we only have the i mean i was brought up as a tory unionist um and and i was that way until 2013 and um, when i decided to educate myself because i'm like well i know how i'm going to vote i know why i've been brought up to think and um, i was told for my whole life that scotland would become a developing nation were we to to separate from the union we wouldn't be able to afford anything we would suddenly um become the non-pc term of a third world country was how i was told the global south um, yeah oh right, 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 right no i see what you're saying no no that's fine that's fine but, that, right, but that's that whole westminster subsidizes scotland lie that keeps the union on board that's a lie that kept my family and me on board I thought that Scotland would be in dire straits without Westminster to fund us until I actually started looking into it and went, it doesn't at all fund us. If anything, we could fund ourselves better than Westminster allows, you know? Like, we, we have far more resources the, to make use of. Um, and it wasn't even political research that got me to change my mind. All I did was read some history books about Scotland and and actually just learn about my country a wee bit and that's what changed my mind um to know something is to begin to love it and to want the best for it and that's what learning scottish history did for me and that's why random scottish history began because i thought if people have access to the same information as i'm coming across and i'm able to purchase for myself if i'm able to put these out of print publications online to make them searchable and available to anyone that's interested, maybe other people will get to like their country because the unionists in this country don't like their country. You can't be a unionist and be pro-Scotland anymore. That, that's not how it works. You have to believe that Scotland can't do for itself to be able to maintain a unionist aspect in Scotland. Because the moment you realise that it can do for itself, far better without the purse strings being held by Westminster, your argument's gone, you know? Like, yeah. um... I, I was more thinking about, you know, English unionists, you know, the ones that are like down here who, they they also seem really attached to the, okay, the Scottish one, I can get if you believe like Westminster's funding the show, but what, what do you think yeah. about, why do you think English unionists are so attached to the union and don't want to see Scotland go? What, what... I... I just think that they see Scotland as being under the thumb. Um, and when you've got... So the Gender Recognition Act is a really good example. Um, whenever Westminster has a chance to knock Scotland back at all or reject policies that Scotland want to enact in any sense, that that's Westminster putting Scotland under the boots, under the thumb, and I think the English unionists are like, well, of course we're keeping Scotland. Like, why would we not keep Scotland? They see it as a region of England. They just see it as a Greater England rather than a Great Britain. You know, I, I genuinely think they see that the English border goes around the the entire. Island. I don't think that they see Scotland as being a country at all. And I've spoken to plenty of English unionists that do not see Scotland as anything other than a larger Yorkshire. Right. You know, um, I, I just think that they believe they own Scotland. They can do what they want with Scotland, and it's not for the Scots to to do anything about it. You okay. know. In terms of, um, there was one question actually I just thought about just when you were talking about like. Uh, Scottish Unionists is mm. do you think if Labour somehow did win um, the elections in Holyrood right do you think they would roll back a lot of the protections the SNP put in place like um, the bedroom tax um, which are the other ones which were the other ones Again, I think Free prescriptions those, that kind of stuff I, I can imagine that they're blind to the fact that the mitigations are what 
still keeping quite a lot of unionists on side. I think they would probably campaign, as they always have done, as being the opposite of the SNP, mm -hmm. as not being on board with SNP policies in any way. Um, because you think, but I think once they took over, they they wouldn't actually make any changes, not in, not any huge changes to that. Because um, you, you would think it'd create a rift, though, wouldn't it? Like if you've got free prescriptions in in say a, a holly a, a labour run Hollywood, right, and you don't yeah. have free prescriptions in a Westminster run um, England, right? You would think yeah. people would be like, "What the hell? Like, why do they? Do you know what I mean? Like, people are like, why should they get you know cheaper universities and free prescriptions?" and have more nationalised rail and um, right. a baby box and things like that when we're run by, you know, effectively you know, almost the same party, we'll say, you know, like la the Labour Party in, in both. Do you know what I mean? I'm not sure I'm going to word this how I want to. Um, it's, it's important to both Labour and the Tories in Scotland to make it seem as if the SNP-led government is failing, okay? Mm -hmm. To the point that they will team up across councils in Scotland. So your two main opposition parties at Westminster are firmly in bed together up in Scotland in councils. They, they team up, they form coalitions in our councils in order to give them greater numbers than the elected SNP councillors. So that they're able to veto whatever um, the SNP council wants to do for whatever area. Right. And that was made really evident recently from East Renfrewshire, where the SNP councillor that was voted in there um, came out and told people how it had gone, this meeting. They had been granted X amount of money by the Scottish government for varying projects um, for their region. And the Tory and Labour factions teamed up to nix a bunch of those projects. And not just nix a bunch of those cost, uh, projects, cost cut some of those, literally strip funding from some of the, the projects. And the SNP councillors outside telling us about it going, we have the money to pay for this, 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 and this, but not only have we been stopped from spending the money on this, 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 and this, they're actually planning on making cuts to this and this and this. Because if they make cuts after the SNP has been voted in, despite the fact that it's been a coalition of the Labour and Tory party that are making the, the decisions effectively, the people on the ground may go, oh, we voted the SNP in and look, nothing's getting funded and this is getting cut and this um, whatever like group um, that's been really useful to folk is no longer even on the go because they can't afford to be on the go anymore. The, the Labour and the Tory party will literally team up to make their areas worse with the view of trying to make it look as if it's worse because the SNP got voted in when it's not the case. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear that. I, I remember, yeah, I we, think it was so in that in was talking about, yeah. unionists on board because it keeps people like, the people that aren't willing to look into a thing against the SNP, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, like, it's, it's kind of deranged that is like just teaming up to, to screw over the council. Yeah. Just what councillor yeah. doesn't accept money to be spent within their region? Yeah. They literally just yeah. went, no, we don't need it. And in fact, not only don't we need it, we're making cuts. Yeah. They're the kind of, it's kind of, it's but an ideological thing. this is the same thing, reason that Labour and Tories aren't getting voted in in Scotland, because the people that are paying attention know that they're doing this. So they're not going to get voted in. It's also the fact that the Labour and Tory party do not speak for Scots, um, neither at Holyrood nor in Westminster, and especially not at Westminster. They're there to laugh and deride at the SNP. Mm -hmm. They're not there for any other reason. I, I think, you know, yeah, if if we go on to a final question, sorry, I'm just trying not to stop because I would eat in a bit. Um, what would you like to see an independent Scotland look like? The top five things, like um, what would you want to see for Scotland's future if it gained independence? Okay, so we would 
have to rejoin the EU. Right, okay. Like, to begin with. So, um, join the EU and maybe, like, another union, like, if another union was also going to add benefits to us, but certainly the EU. Right. Um, but we, we would would think we'd be open to, to joining EFTA, etc. Like, um, other... Yeah versions you know and um, because union is good and this is why scots prior to the world wars were pro-union and pro like scotland was because they knew unions were typically good things because unions made everyone equal unions were to the benefit of all you know with, um, with scotland as well like, i think the population sizes would be more similar to norway rather than yeah, UK, so EFTA wouldn't massive, be an issue for yeah. Scotland. Like, it would be an issue for England, not an issue for yeah. Scotland to join. Yeah, because it's more um, similar to the more of the Nordic countries. Yeah, so, so we'd get that over and done with. Um, in doing that, um, once again, we're going to have the benefits of the European Union, um, yep. the single market, travel, trade, all that. So we're also going to see an influx of population off the back of that, the same as Ireland saw. Yeah. Like, on the advent of Brexit. Just make sure so you we deal would, with your housing crisis better when it happens. So we would have a rise in population. We would also be able to encourage people to, to come to Scotland. So it would be immigration off the back of just Scots wanting yep. people to come and join us here. Um, so I would want to see housing projects invested in hugely. Um, I would want to see like a, a really good substantial rise in housing. I would want to see infrastructure um oh, focused so ha ha on housing two infrastructure three okay yeah um infrastructure would have to be focused on i'm not just talking about bridges and roads and i'm talking about for the oil industry um for power for energy storage um again like your your steel industries and shipbuilding etc yeah, yeah all that could be invested in and you're reignited talking, you're talking big infrastructure we're talking like ports yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah. Like, so energy yeah. um Project, transport you know? yeah yeah that kind of stuff get all that fire lit under all of them you know um and and then everything would just fall into place i would think um because the people there'd be more employment with those um sectors yep reignited and reinstituted um you would uh so people would just have a better life they would have a better work life balance as well there could be um policies enacted in order to kind of give people that better work-life balance, maybe give people four-day work weeks or whatever, you know, uh, like the... I said, the I said hopes, not a utopia. This is not... Um, I said hopes for the future, not a utopian future. These are no. my hopes. These are all feasible. Yeah, that no, um, four-day work week is, yeah. Yeah, it's possible. There's also... Uh, is it UBI? Uh, Universal Basic <laughs> Income. That's four. I think that'll be the fourth one, yeah. Because that was something that the Scottish government were already wanting to trial. Um, I think, like in some of the cities, uh, Glasgow, Dundee, Aberdeen, I think they were looking to trial um, some kind of universal basic, basic income. So I think that that would be something that they'd already I think already they've done it in board. Wales. I think they've mm -hmm. trialed it in Wales, in some parts of Wales. I think there have been trials going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so that's also put everything suddenly becomes possible yes. on the advent of Scottish self determination. Do you know what I mean? Not just like, see if you tackle the big things, you find that the small things just fall into sure. place. You got you know one I mean? more. Like, Is there any more, you, a fifth one you would want? I would want us to be able to be friends with Westminster. I would want us to be able to be not just diplomatic with each other. I would want us to be able to work together with Westminster on um, on whatever might affect the island as a whole um, mm -hmm. in terms of, say, global warming um, and environmental issues. I would want us to be able to work together right. on these kind of things as well. I wouldn't want there to be any kind of resentment or lasting animosity like uh, after uh, the fact because there would be no need for yeah. that, you know, like... Um, yeah. Okay, that that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, those are good. Those are good five. Um, I'd say. 
and if people have more suggestions they can put that in the comments i would go yeah. for you know there's that american politician who said a a uh, a chicken in every oven would you would you run with the policy of a fried mars bar in every basket would that be popular because that's the one of the few things i know about scottish cuisine is you guys eat fried mars bars <laughs> that's you guys tried running sure. with that? a fried mars <laughs> <laughs> I can't recommend a deep fried bar, not unless it's a tempura batter. I, I have done it once in my own. Okay, the, it, but fryer, tempura, tempura batter, uh, like a Mars bar, chop it up into little bite-sized pieces and put it in tempura batter. It's yeah, lovely. Yeah. It's all light and fluffy and melty. It's lovely. I, I might have to try it at some point. I have, I tried it once. It wasn't great. My brother liked it though. So not there, your yeah. chip shop batter. Yeah, yeah I, I really cool. recommend a tempura, a nice light tempura batter. Th you there know. you go. Uh, a fried a fried Mars bar in every basket. There, that's good enough for the people. Um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. I think that's yeah. a good point to wrap up. I think um, it's been good, a good conversation. I think it took for like almost Enjoyed two hours. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, yeah. Hardly even had to refer to my notes at all. <laughs> Is that a good thing? I don't know. Um, I think it's a good thing. Like... Probably, yeah. I, I think we've gone through kind of Scotland joining. The, I think it's like the beginning to where we are now. I guess, like where where Scotland started, like the the process of joining the union to um, where we are now, which is. Scotland looking mm -hmm. to still looking to leave the union, um, but kind of momentum stifled. Uh, I, I guess it's the, worth the, it. Just... The whole seeking to leave the union is a really new thing. I mean, after it failed, like in seventeen thirteen, we were just resigned to it, yeah. and then we became proponents of it. And it all the Scots did from then on was just try to get what we were owed and and an equal share of everything. Uh... The the desire to actually end the union that's that only really got going in the 60s and it, it's obviously been a slow burn since we're 60 years on yeah um, i i think the final point worth addressing is kind of hollywood was designed to keep um not majority independent parties out that's why there's a coalition between the snp and the greens right yeah and then the final point is um like despite what hollywood is trying to do they can't actually trigger a referendum like that goes through westminster that's what the courts decided as well the, the yeah um... we, we have to be given the the authority to hold her we have to be given the right to hold a, a referendum the scottish government hasn't the ability to do that on its own as a branch office it really doesn't have any powers to go against westminster at all can't you trigger article 50 or article 48 uh, i can't remember which one it was <laughs> I am not up with contemporary possibilities. It's, it's the, the it's the EU one. Or... It's the one it's the one that we triggered to uh, come out of the EU. I think it's Article fifty. Right, is it? Yeah. It was the one is the one that the uh Brexit is it not like a, it's an art section thirty we need? Like um we're needing because Salmon was able to get a section thirty. He just he was too confident. He was just like, Yeah, yeah. let's have a referendum, let's do it. Despite the fact that we might be leaving the Union, like the European Union, in a couple of years, yeah, fuck it, let's see how yeah, it goes. I, I think like, hindsight's really good for that one, because had it happened after the Brexit referendum, I think it would have been very difficult. If it happened now, I think it would have been very difficult to convince anyone that the Union is, is functional. We also wouldn't have that once in a generation bullshit. Yeah, like, that's what. Um, repeated, that's, repeated, that's what uh, what's his name, man? Austerity boy, Rory Stewart push. He said, oh, you know, we all agreed it was a once in a generation. No one, like, no one that. said that. Alex Salmon said that, sure. But that's yeah. one dude. Yeah, no no one ratified that. No one it's, made yes. a contract of that. It's not like, in it's not in the legislation. Like once in a generation yeah. is not you know, and that's once every you know, it's ironic, the guy who's trying to get us back into the EU on the back of a quote once in a ref once a generation EU you know, Brexit referendum is saying no, Scots have to wait. But for for but Brexit, no, we're not gonna wait. And it's like it's a bit the ironic. The unionists are seeing the European Union as being akin to the British Union. They're just seeing union. Union yeah. good. So we want to go back into EU. Why would Scotland want to leave the Union? Union good. They want yeah. to get back into the EU. So so why would they want to leave the 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 British Union? It's like because one's beneficial, one's detrimental, yeah, pal. One, have a look one at is, it. Just, one, you know, th there's a veto. Like countries that are hungry, like all countries have a veto. So you have to take I've it seriously like, on certain votes, like regardless like, of how small yeah, they books, are. I've got four books published by myself that that will tell whoever wants to know it, how the union has gone for us. If they want to compare that information uh, and those detrimental effects to, to what the EU offered, 
by all means, do it. Yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll see why Scotland wants to rejoin the EU and leave the British Union, you know? I'd be interested in seeing more conversations between kind of, excuse me, Scottish independence and um, unionists, because I, I don't get what the unionist arguments are. I've not heard them really make it that well, so I'd be interested because in... Because there aren't any good arguments. It's all emotional arguments. It's all like... Oh no, but but our friends and family and colleagues are in England, and why would we want to separate? Why would we want to? We're not going anywhere. We're you're literally leave the land landlocked together. You're leaving, on an you're leaving the landmass. You're gonna you're gonna blow up the border, and it's gonna yeah, separate. Yeah, out. yeah, we're just gonna sail off. Yeah, <laughs> like, you're gonna sail off towards we're Canada. We're not gonna be the same distance away from our family, colleagues, and friends. You're, you're There's gonna, not actually going to be a difference in that. You know, you're like, gonna sail off and get a border with Norway. Yeah, we're not suddenly going to become enemies. Oh. <laughs> well, my hope is that at least those in authority aren't going to be yeah. super you... animal, like you know, yeah. super angry with each other. And... What's What's crazy is I got through this whole thing without making a groundskeeper Willie reference. My favourite Scott. <laughs> uh. <laughs> we love groundskeeper Willie. Yeah, he's 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 funny. I like him. But yeah, anyways, he I'll, made I'll... a solid case for independence back in he did. He did. Yeah, he, he said did. to vote for Scottish independence, which is very very surprising. He would make such an intervention, but you know, he knew what he was talking well, but... about. Well. But but yeah, I'm happy to wrap it there. If you are, unless there's any final points you want to make. No, I'm I'm good with that. I think we've covered quite a lot of bases. Like, yeah, cool. I'll try and get this published as soon as possible. We'll see what folks say in the comments. Like, oh, you know, yeah, can't wait for that. I, I can't imagine. Ready to rebut folk, you know? I can't imagine too many people unionists are going to be interested in a two-hour conversation. To be honest, I know. I don't but... know. Like, I I don't doubt that you've got unionist subscribers oh, who are just know, going to watch it because got... you've put it out. And then be like, what the fuck? Like, this, is, got, this is what I was expecting to hear. I've got like, so many, like, my subscriber base is so odd sometimes because I've got, like, the Owen Jones video I put out, people are just having an absolute meltdown about what he said. And I'm just like, guys, like, what yeah. he said wasn't that bad. Like, no. Super Tansky went on a big rant about him as well. Don't like, start. I know, I know. Like, don't I know. start. I've, I've already addressed I watch, I, I've already she, addressed, She's like, yeah. One of my only sources of information when it comes to English. Please politics. get better sources, <laughs> please. They I don't exist. Know what I want to, like... But no, I don't, I don't. I don't really get what their arguments are. To be honest about what he said, like they criticise Labour, but when Jones does it, it's bad. So okay. It's because you, you've got to be. You, you can't say bad things. We need them in government, don't yeah. you know? You're not allowed to say bad things. Don't pe say anything that's going to stop people from voting for them they, because they, they've said we need the Tories like, replaced. They, you know? They've literally like, said, like, Labour should stop praising Thatcher, and she got real mad about it. And so did Graham Hughes. And it's like, okay, so are you allowed to criticise Labour or not? Like, I need to know which one is it. Or is it only you who guys I mean, you are allowed to, to criticise them? I don't get I it. Mean, it even like SNP adherents aren't shy at like outing them when it's like that was a really fucking stupid thing you just did. You yeah. know what I mean? Like um and the SNP in itself I think have in a few occasions been quite open and honest about failings and people have resigned quite happily just off the back. So, you know, we we don't we're not like the Tories where like we just try and hold on to everybody just you know, yeah. to save face, do you know what I mean? Um, I think we are, like, quite happy to to have the SNP kind of answerable to us. I, I, I just to a find extent, it, yeah, you know? I just find it hilarious how Labour are praising Thatcher, despite Thatcher being hated, especially in Scotland. But Tony like, Blair, he, he was very open about the fact he was furthering ta Thatcher policies. Yeah. It's, and... Ken, you're, you guys are seeing them as totally opposite things down in Westminster. Up here, they are the same entity. Uh, uh, they are uh, one and the same. They they act together. They share the same policies. They share the same goals. They've very yeah. much embedded together uh, up here. I think I think it depends who you ask on how close the two parties are. To be mm. honest with you, um, so it, it depends. It depends who you ask. And and right now, given the fact that they have the same fiscal rules, it's very mm. hard to argue that they're different. Um, to be honest. They're not different. And, yeah. and I mean, I consider it foreign politics, lessons, but I was shocked that it was Labour that brought up austerity. Say what? I was like, what the fuck? Seriously? Like, you, you couldn't just wait five minutes for the Tories to, to introduce it? No? Like, 
okay. <laughs> what are you talking about? Austerity is such a Tory fucking thing. Do you know what I mean? It's... Yeah. And yet it was Labour this time around that just went, no, we're going to need to, because it oh, worked so well about... the last time around. Oh, you're, talking about, you're talking about maxing out the credit cards and all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's um, it, it's yeah. kind of funny because people keep arguing that Labour aren't pro austerity. It's like they're using the same arguments and they're using the same fiscal rule, and yeah. they're saying they're not going to increase taxation. So how they're are they going to generate money? They're literally saying it out loud. They're telling you what they're going to do. Yeah, but you know, as and a, yet they're still going to get voted in because they're not the Tories. A, as a wise man once said, you know, it's just the smokescreen. It's not yeah. an issue. People need to stop listening to the words and seeing the actions. I think they need to. Well, you know, people keep arguing, well, you have to wait for them to get into power before you see their actions. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm not going to give them the chance to do anything done. Like, that's stupid. I think people are going to be really sad. I think people are going to realise really quickly that they might have got rid of the Tories, but things aren't getting better quickly yeah. under Labour. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I hope I hope they change things. Like, I, I really hope that this is just a smokescreen, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not seeing it. Maybe I'm stuck in the smoke, I don't know. But um, yeah, I'll, 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 we'll cut the video here. I think. Okay. All right. Thanks for thanks for coming on the channel. You're very welcome, darling. It was All good right. fun. Like... Yeah.